Welcome to the Need to Know podcast from the Wilson Center, a podcast for policymakers available to everyone. Always informative, nonpartisan, and relevant, we go beyond the headlines to understand the trend lines in foreign policy. Welcome back to another episode of Need to Know. I'm your host, John Molesky. This week, we focus on the changing face of warfare due to the increased use of UAVs or unmanned area vehicles. You may commonly refer to them as drones. We're going to do so through the lens of a new study co-authored by our guest and based on, among other things, on-the-ground observations in Ukraine. He is Wilson Center Global Fellow, Dr. Jack Watling. Jack also serves as Senior Research Fellow for Land Warfare at the Royal United Services Institute. He close, works closely with British military on the development of concepts of operation, assessments of the future operating environment, and conducts operational analysis of contemporary conflicts like the one we're going to speak about today. The paper is titled, Mass Precision Strike, Designing UAV Complexes for Land Forces. It's the first of a three-part series. Jack, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, John. So let me ask you from a layperson's perspective, the title's a bit jargony. So if you would tell us what it is, what did you look at? So precision strike has been uh, the ability to land uh, munition on a target uh, accurately. And that has been a key capability ever since the 1980s. But it has always been something that militaries can do at a relatively small scale. And so you have to be very discerning in what you go after. What we are seeing today is that a range of technologies that come together in UAVs are allowing precision strike to be done at a previously unimagined scale. And that has a massive set of consequences for how land forces protect themselves, maneuver, how they deploy, and how they actually generate those effects against an adversary. Uh, Jack, how seismic is this change in warfare? Is this a fundamental change in the way we think about operations on the battlefield, or is it just another tool? I think you can see what happens when a force doesn't take this capability into consideration and how it fights. When you look at the war in Nagorno-Karabakh that happened in 2020, Azerbaijan blitzed its way through what had been very densely prepared defensive lines by Armenia, mainly using these capabilities. Uh, on the other hand, if you do take preparatory steps, if you adopt the right tactics, then you can effectively counter these capabilities. So it's not something that renders all of our old capabilities obsolete, uh, but it changes the way we do business. And if you fail to keep up, then you will be extremely vulnerable. Along those lines, in the report, you, you refer to those legacy strike systems. In comparing when you use one versus the other, how should people think about this? So they shouldn't think about it as one replacing the other. It's not like you get rid of your artillery, you bring in drones. They are complementary, right? So a lot of drones mm -hmm. can find targets and provide precise coordinates and also adjust the fire by reporting on where shells are landing to make old legacy artillery much more responsive and precise. At the same time, when they work together, UAVs and legacy artillery pose challenges for the defender that you didn't have to deal with before. So we used to shoot and scoot, right? You would fire your artillery piece and then move so that the enemy couldn't fire against where you where you shot from and hit you. Now, if you fire and displace, you might miss the counter battery fire from the enemy artillery, but you will be hit by a UAV while you're traversing to your next position. And so you have to be able to defend against these things. Um, and the paper is about how we field these capabilities. The second one in the series will look at how we defend ourselves against it. Mm -hmm. so speaking of the various implications, whether it be for the actual ground forces, strategy, the economics of warfare, uh, uh, what are those that are most immediate and that must be addressed with some urgency? So I think that the real challenge is that uh, the way that UAVs work, they depend upon the ability to communicate. Uh, they depend upon software on their systems that tell them how to behave based on the input of their sensors. And those are things that you can interfere with. You can interfere with them through electronic warfare. And what we're observing is that in order to keep these capabilities functioning on the battlefield, you have to rapidly iterate. You have to be able to swap out components to replace and update the software on a 
regular basis. The problem is our procurement structures don't really facilitate that kind of rapid updating and fiddling and alteration of a capability. And so the first lesson is that we need to make sure our procurement processes can get our soldiers the equipment they need at the speed that is required. Um, the second major challenge is that like any weapon system, it requires a specialist skill set to pilot these things and to plan how to execute and use them. And so we need a community of specialist operators who are not just trained to use a particular platform, but understand how to get inside it and how to get the most out of it. Um, and then the third thing is there are some mission sets like deep strike, so going and striking targets that are a long way over the front line, logistics hubs and so forth, that previously you had to be very focused on what you struck. Because these capabilities can be cheaper, you can go after many more targets. Um, but that requires uh, some very, very carefully designed systems so that the economy of scaling those strikes actually works out because they are also much easier to intercept. And there therefore has to be a ruthless prioritization of the mission in order to make them as cheap and efficient as possible. Uh, on the procurement question, what is it about the procurement process that needs to be reformed to make it more nimble and more responsive to the actual needs? So a lot of the regulation around UAV development comes from how we regulate it for aircraft, because these are uh, aerial objects that are in airspace. Sometimes they carry weapons. And if they go out of control, that poses a flight safety risk. So there are very logical reasons why they were treated in the same way as aircraft for a long time in terms of how you manage the airspace. The problem is that when you add in the regulatory burden, you slow down procurement and you massively increase the cost of each individual platform. You also encourage the manufacturers not to think about it as a, uh, uh, you know, a motherboard, a, an airframe into which you plug different capabilities but instead they think about it as a complete product that they need to certify and then sell as many of as possible. When you start having to iteratively develop it very, very fast, the regulation of that system can't keep up. The approvals of it can't keep up. And so the first thing is, how do we regulate it so that on the one hand it is safe, on the other hand, we are not imposing an uncompetitive cost and slowing down the uh, improvement and development of the system such that we lose competitiveness with our adversaries? That's a key question. There are lots of other questions, like how do you manage the intellectual property when the military needs to get in there and change the software or needs to take a third party, another company, and start integrating components from that other company into something that was originally designed by the first company? Lots of companies want to protect their intellectual property. That is a reasonable uh, thing for them to want to do, but we need a way of being able to work through that challenge. This sort of reminds me of trying to stay a step ahead of hackers, where things are changing rapidly, and so you're, you always have to be looking down the road. In this context, what are we talking about as far as keeping these software systems up to date that operate the UAVs? How rapidly is the response necessary to make? And let's use the current conflict in Ukraine as an example. Are we yeah. talking days, weeks, months? In Ukraine, you're probably looking at software updates between two to six weeks, depending on wow. the type of UAV and the mission. And you're probably looking at hardware updates within three months. Wow. So are we anywhere close to being able to meet that need? Uh, at a small scale, we are absolutely able to, to do this. Uh, but our procurement systems do not allow us to scale that kind of capability across our forces. Is there victory in Ukraine for Ukraine without UAVs? A, a scenario for victory? Uh, I mean, no. UAVs are very important for how the mm -hmm. Ukrainians fight, but it's important to note that they can't win with UAVs alone. The, the thing that Ukraine is desperately short of today is artillery ammunition. And if they're going to get the most out of their UAVs, they need that ammunition. So it's not... It's not a UAVs or, it's a UAVs right. and. Yeah. yeah, and both. But, you know, um, I don't want to dumb this down, but I'm trying to think it's almost like uh, how you would measure this as far as NATO's preparedness, Ukraine, consequently, their preparedness is working with NATO. Uh, you know, where are we on a scale of, say, if one to ten is we know the drill, we have the resources, we have the equipment, we're ready to roll. 
where one is forget about it we're we're up against it and we you know where do we live on that scale at the currently at the current uh, time i would say four um wow and you know in terms of where we actually are right yes but yes the good news is we know how to get to eight pretty quickly hmm. there okay. are some specific challenges that we don't have answers for yet and that's a challenge um but for the most part we know what needs to change the the challenge is breaking through some of these regulatory barriers so that those changes can be implemented. And, and beyond the regulatory barriers, talk about the economics. Is this a more expensive or less expensive form of warfare? It's very, very expensive if you get it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the challenges is that when we talk about a drone, it covers everything from a $400 toy all the way up to a $150 million capability, the size of a regional airliner. And so if you're not disciplined, you end up paying a lawful lot of money for a platform that's probably not survivable. A good example of this was Turkey's TB2s. You know, those cost uh, more than a million dollars each. Um, the exact price point depends on the customer and so on. So giving an exact price is, is harder. But they are well above a million dollars each. And they lasted about 10 days as a functional military capability in Ukraine. There were some very specific tasks the Ukrainians used them for uh, after that point, like maritime patrol. But it was really trying to find ways they could use them rather than them being a useful military asset. Um, simply because their radar cross-section is too big, their ground control stations are too easy to detect. So if you are not disciplined about where UAVs add the most value and ruthless in simplifying them so that against that mission set, then you can spend a lot of money on a capability that is not suitable for the modern combat environment. On the other hand, if you get it right, the level of damage you will inflict for a very low cost is extraordinary. What is the level of forward thinking in various countries, whether the UK, the US or NATO collectively? How far down the tracks are we in rethinking what warfare will look like with the introduction of this new technology? So in the UK, I think the British Army's land operating concept and the work that has flowed from it, uh, which was published, you know, that, that's over a year old now, but that really laid the groundwork for uh, a, a framework for the army to think about how the lessons from Ukraine plug into the force. Um, so the UK is there. I think we're going to see some announcements from the US Army over the next uh, few months leading up to probably AUSA, which is held in October, um, that show that the US Army is also landing on some pretty clear conclusions about what the future operating environment is like and how they need to change to meet it. Um, and so, yes, there are answers out there that are now solidifying. The question is, how long does it take us to turn those answers into something that is real and tangible in terms of how the force is structured, trained and equipped? Um, and that's not just something that the army uh, needs to get after. You need Congress. You need our legislators to be able to uh, work with the army to make sure that the procurement systems, the regulation and so forth allow us to build the force that we need. And wh where does the private sector factor into the equation? Well, so the private sector is in, you know, indispensable in delivering these capabilities. They hold a lot of the expertise um, and it's their innovation which has led to a lot of these technologies. On the other hand, uh, the private sector responds to incentives and some of the incentives that the current procurement system foists on industry are highly counterproductive for the kind of relationship between defense and the industry that we need. So getting those incentives right is a key part of making sure that we reform procurement in a way that makes us uh, you know, ready to meet the challenges of the next decade. Jack, have you thought about it in terms of if you were gonna create a list of who are the world leaders in advancing this technology, whether they be governments or private sector entities, is there such a list percolating in your head? There is. Uh, I'm reluctant to start calling out individual companies and uh, <laughs> products. Uh, but there is a wide margin between those who are really good at this and those who, you know, give a good talk, but don't actually follow through with capabilities. And I think one of the one of the useful things uh, coming out of Ukraine is that that is an environment where, you know, 
what people say can get put to the test very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it separates out those who really do know what they're talking about from those who have a good pitch and a slide deck, but don't actually know what they're talking about. Uh, final thought, Jack, and, and I mentioned to you that Need to Know's primary target audience is Capitol Hill. It's members of staff. It's members of Congress itself. So if you're giving advice directly to lawmakers, I know you've done some private briefings while you're here in D.C. Uh, what do you tell them? You know, how should they be organizing their priorities as they think about this, as they vote on legislation, as they vote on funding? Left to their own devices, uh, your armed services are going to come up with programs that meet the rules and the procedures that they are obliged to follow, and they will assume that they can't necessarily reshape those rules. Um, the reality is those rules are currently a bit of a straitjacket on making the force what it needs to be. And so I would encourage legislators to go and talk to U.S. Army Futures Command uh, and go and talk to the relevant bits of the force uh, to make sure that there is a shared view of what the procurement process needs to look like and what regulation needs to look like to realize what the now pretty robust data sets uh, that AFC are working with tell us is required. Um, and I'm not an expert on the US uh, legislation and procurement process. I work with the British military. So I would hesitate to say, this is, you know, these are the specific changes that are needed here. Yeah. But it really needs to be a collaboration to make sure that when the army is constructing the programs of record to be able to get these capabilities into service, there is uh, a flexibility and an agility to the regulation and legislation in how money is spent to ensure that that can be done in a way that means you get the best return for your investment. Because what we don't have at this point is time. Dr. Jack Watling, thank you. A brilliant piece of work, vital work. We look forward to parts two and three. Thanks for joining us today. Good to be with you. Uh, for those of you interested in learning more, you can visit wilsoncenter.org and use the Programs tab to visit the Global Europe Program. There you'll find a link to this study and, and much more, we've the, the thing we've been discussing today and much more. And we'll be back soon with another episode of Need to Know. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for your time and interest.